Bitcoin is something that will really change the way you live your life. It changes the way you think about the world, changes the way you think about how you interact with people and society. This thing seems to just not go away. It just keeps on growing and just keeps on making more waves of adoption. Like uh, all of a sudden we have companies, countries and everyone in, in there. Bitcoin is the foundation for this golden age of reason. There's going to be no point to try and own four houses so that you can have three of them be Airbnbs in the, in that Bitcoin future. That's going to change architecture. I think we're going to stop building these temporary structures. We're just going to expand and start thinking about possibilities in, in new ways because we would be able to build incredible things if, if it wasn't based on fiat. Bitcoin is a system that allows you to preserve that energy. So then it removes the threat of having someone steal your time from you. If I'm not worried about my time being stolen, then I don't need to steal yours. You have a great book. Uh, at least uh, the title was was really interesting for me when I saw it. Uh, the DAO of Bitcoin. The first thing that I thought of is because DAO in the cryptoverse stands for decentralized organ, uh, decentralized automized organization. That was like, oh, is this is this some shitcoin thing? <laughs> but it's something completely different. Uh, and Taoism is something that, that then I googled. Uh, but before we get into Bitcoin side of things, maybe let's explain a little bit um, what Taoism is and what what you what did you inspire that you wrote, wrote the book? Yeah, for sure. I you know and I, and I uh, so there's there's two ways of translating that word from Chinese into English, and you see it sometimes with a T Tao and sometimes with a D Tao. And uh, in terms of how it's where the language is going with standard Chinese, it makes more sense. And I think it's more appropriate to, to say it and spell it with a D. And so I, I've had lots of questions about Dao because of this crypto term. And uh, obviously, like along the way, planning the book, I had lots of opportunities to make a decision about which one I was going to use. And I I felt like it's the more more true to the to the language. So in spite of the uh, the conflict, uh, that, that was kind of why I decided to go that way. Um, Taoism is a, is a sort of philosophical and religious tradition that emerged out of China uh, around 4th century BC and uh, has to do with a belief and study in an underlying and fundamental principle that uh, creates and connects all things in, in the universe. And that thing is the Tao. And so it's a, it's a study of this, uh, this force and... Um, the practice of trying to live your life in alignment with this force. And uh, so I, I have been studying Chinese uh, culture and history, and I, I lived in China for a while. So my whole life has been uh, following this subject. And when I got into Bitcoin, uh, very early on, I started just thinking about these similarities and alignments between the subjects and had been thinking about writing a book like this for a long time. I was really surprised Nobody had written one already because uh, Taoism is a is you know it's not the hugest um, tradition in the world, but it's pretty big. You know, there's a lot of Bitcoiners, and uh, it's not that I'm the first person to write something on this subject. There, there's some writings on it, but uh, yeah, it was the first book of its kind, and uh, they're they're two just fascinating subjects. I think Bitcoin is something that will really change the way you live your life. It changes the way you think about the world changes the way you think about how you interact with with people and and society and uh and this is also true of Taoism. this is sort of the the foundation of why i think there's at least sort of an interesting comparison to be made because they, they both um you know Taoism was created in a in a very difficult or birth the ideas were birthed at a very difficult time in chinese history and uh with the hope of reimagining a new way of governing society and helping people organize themselves in a more harmonious way. And, uh, and you could say the same thing about Bitcoin. You know, I think this is very true that uh, Bitcoin was birthed out of a very tumultuous financial time that uh, has since gotten a little bit more bumpy and uh, with the hopes of a brighter future. You know, Satoshi really wanted to be able to pass something forward to humanity that could really uh, reimagine how we think about connecting and organizing ourselves. And so that's sort of the basis for the, the comparison. Mm, I, I love it. And, and, uh, 
and there's a lot of uh, books and a lot of um, writings around general like religion, uh, around uh, philosophies, uh, around um, thinking styles, I would call it right now, uh, compared to Bitcoin and how we, we think of that like this. Uh, uh, you wrote also a book like Bitcoin for financial advisors. There are like books for conservatives. There are books for, for all types of, of, of people connecting it with Bitcoin. I'm, I think this is like the main learning for me for all the podcast interviews that you, you can connect Bitcoin with almost everything. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really interesting for me to connect it with Taoism. Um, what are like for people that have almost no clue, uh, like me, <laughs> myself, uh, what about Taoism? What are the core like principles or teachings uh, that come in there that connect with Bitcoin? Yeah, and and I think maybe just to add on to your point a little bit there, you know, it makes sense to me that people have connected already, you know, Bitcoin in the Bible and and uh, Bitcoin and and Hindu tradition, wh whatever these. I think it's because Bitcoin has these aspects of that that uh, that tie into and relate to treating people better. Uh, you know, showing up in the world more authentically and um, and it's, it's eliminating all of these problems that are downstream of the result of of other people being in charge of manipulating money. You know, and this this is something that is also very true of of that period in ancient his in, in ancient Chinese history that birth Taoism was, uh, you know, failed experiments in paper money where people at the top eventually you know, steal everyone else's money through the problem of inflation. And, uh, and, and it creates turmoil and uncertainty. And what, what society I think really needs are, are rules. And this is part of what religion does is help provide people with guidelines so that they know how to like arrange themselves in, in a sort of a peaceful and, uh, successful civilization. And, uh, yeah, so, so, The key tenets of Taoism, there's sort of three that I really highlight in the book. And uh, the first one is a principle of non-action, which is called Wu Wei. And uh, non-action in Taoism is this idea that uh, you really want to try to exert the, the appropriate amount of force for any action that you're taking in life to make something happen. And all the time in life, we get out of alignment with what the correct amount of, of force is. So it's easy to sort of push too hard or push not quite hard enough. And you always know, if you think about your own life, when you've done one or the other, we're, we're doing this stuff all the time, right? And in the book, I talk a little bit about my, my history is doing sales. I've been in financial services sales forever. And when you, when you try to sell something too hard, you know, you want it too bad. That's when you push somebody away. You're trying to close the sale too much. And uh, equally, you know, it, if you haven't tried hard enough, you haven't made enough effort, you haven't expressed enough interest, then that's where you can sort of see things sort of drift away. So the principle of non-action is sort of like this idea of there's a natural current of, of things that are flowing around you. And all you're trying to do is align yourself with that current and find yourself moving with the direction of everything. And, and even this idea, I think, is something that you know, Bitcoin is a current, right? It, this is something that is, it is, it's a direction and, and people who try to swim the opposite way that could be with like, you know, crypto stuff or, uh, you know, shorting Bitcoin, they're, they're not going to participate. Bitcoin is a current. It's happening whether you want to participate in, in it or not. And I, you know, the, the easiest way to, to be successful in these things is just to, you know, align yourself with it and, and, uh, you know, come along for the ride. Um, I, I, the second one that I talk a lot about in the book is this concept of duality, which is uh, captured by the symbol of Taoism that everyone is familiar with, which is the yin yang. And the, this concept represents sort of the independence of opposites in the natural world This sort of dynamic balance of everything having sort of two sides. And in Taoism, it, it's a really important part of the study to understand that, uh, you know, if you think about a 24-hour cycle turning from day into night, it, it's a gradual transformation and it's the same day. So day and night are not separate things. It's a, it's a constant flow where one is always transforming into the other and then back again and the cycle sort of starts anew. And... 
in a study of the duality of the yin and yang, you learn a lot by reflecting on something's opposite. So, so you learn about things by understanding what they're not. And uh, th this is an important way for, for uh, you know, sort of gaining insight and perspective because, it, it, you know, it's almost impossible to really understand uh, something if you don't understand its opposite. And uh, so, so this is a, um, a really important part of, of the way Taoists sort of think about and imagine the world. And the third thing that I, the third sort of key point that I talk a lot about in the book is the concept of um, the particular and the whole. And so another piece in Taoism is that it, uh, when I mentioned this at the start is that uh, the Tao is um, this sort of universal force of creation. And it's also a thing that people think about and study. And so it, it's simultaneously both this thing, this subject that exists, uh, this this force, and and it's also a, a something that people direct their attention to and think about and change their life as a result of having thought about. So it's sort of both of those things. It's a, it's like the subject and the object, and um, and this is also true of Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin is a monetary system, it's a technology, and we love to you know, use it and interact with it and own it. But then it's also something that we study. And as a result of studying it, it changes the way we think about the world. And it changes how we really think about everything. And, and so it, it's both, you know, it's, it's simultaneously both these things. It's something that does a very specific function. And it's also something that has taken on a life of its own and sort of become this like, you know, Bitcoin is like a philosophy or a it's sort of a, an intellectual tradition now, even though it's very young on, in its own. And who knows, maybe in a thousand years, what people will be thinking about Bitcoin, early Bitcoiners today. You know, this could very well turn into some kind of ancient tradition, given enough time, I think. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's fascinating. Think of like what, what Bitcoin can go in. And, and I, I have so many thoughts about around that, because when you look at uh, Bitcoiners right now, how they celebrate the technology, how we talk about the technology, how we embrace the technology. Uh, it's almost like it's it's almost like an, a way of life, a philosophy, like something way bigger and deeper than just money. Uh, and but when we look at the history, at some point email technology was really exciting. I don't know if it ever got to the point where it was that exciting as uh, Bitcoin, but it also did not have an underlying asset, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. which you could benefit financially from. So, um, uh, now people actually can make, uh, um, something inside of, 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 of Bitcoin and be in, in the ecosystem, uh, and, 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 uh, have an, and gain from that financially, but also uh, as a, as a person in general, I feel like, um, but. I feel like it would be really boring to talk about email uh, and, 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 and those stuff right now. And maybe Bitcoin will also be just there at some point. Maybe Bitcoin will be also like in, in 20 years, everybody, everyone will use it, but there will not be a Bitcoin podcast because it will be a really boring topic. It will be just be there. Uh, it, it's interesting for me to think of like maybe Bitcoin leads into like a way of life or there's like an... Uh, a Bitcoin philosophy coming out uh, and, and Satoshi things like uh, it, it could melt in something really big or it could be really boring. Uh, either way, Bitcoin will succeed. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but it's interesting for me to, to, to think of that. And, and you, you, you think that it, it could be more than, than just the technology and the money that we have it uh, right now. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it absolutely is because, you know, I think like, the, the 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 key difference for me is that almost nobody in the world can exist by ignoring money. So there is no way to to be in the world and and not participate in a monetary system. And money, even today, forget about Bitcoin. Money is so much more than uh, a tool that we use to exchange value. It's a language of value. So money is a way that we think about and arrange our ideas about reality. Right? Money is a system that we use all of us all the time to you know think about our goals and priorities and how we're you know gathering the the value of the time that we're spending to earn this money to transform it into other things that we want and so we're we're constantly uh, you know money is just like a 
a programming language that each of us has as relative to the place in the world that we grew up in. I think is like the most, the weirdest thing about money that's happening right now is that there are like 167 different currencies in the world now. And so of course we have all these different languages being used of how people value everything. And, uh, so, so a bigger thing that I think is going on and, you know, this might take 20 years, it might take a hundred years, but every currency that fails and goes away as there's some sort of con consolidation. And maybe that eventually I believe will end up with just one system of money where you're talking about. And, uh, at that point, now we have eliminated all these different regional and local systems of value, these languages of assessing the world and replaced it instead with one. And so um, this is also another uh, sort of key idea that comes back to Taoism is, you know, in, in Taoism, it's, it's one central force. There's one sort of universal law and power that is responsible for everything. And this is where I believe Bitcoin is going with money. It is the one universal money for all people. And uh, that itself becomes the foundation for a single uh, sort of species level way of thinking about everything. And uh, it could then be the foundation for people to think about things at like a species level for us to start to have goals that extend beyond our local borders. And um because Bitcoin also simultaneously eliminates the possibility of stealing other people's stuff. And uh, so Bitcoin is this incredibly peaceful technology, right? I, I, you know, I think that um, this is another reason why I was really quite motivated to write the book is that a, a core principle of Taoism is that, uh, you know, it, Taoism is an is a anti-violent philosophy. And uh, Bitcoin to me is the most peaceful technology that has ever been invented. So there's there's been also discussions about, you know, maybe Bitcoin's future role in geopolitics and, and the international uh, military strategy or how, however you want to phrase it. And I, and I think that in, in fact, what it, what it will do is a hard money that's available to the entire world will will make the the, the cost of a aircraft carrier or you know these things will become so expensive when you can't print money out of thin air to pay for them that it's going to actually change the entire way we think about uh, power projection between countries because if a country has to bankrupt itself just to pay for these incredibly expensive military devices, it, you know, it's going to change the economics of warfare. So uh, I think that it's, it has the, it, it does have a universal power to really sort of unify and pacify, uh, you know, it, were it to be successful in becoming the sort of the world's one and single money. Is, is that the, the, the core message of, of the book? Um, you know, I, I think the message is, uh, if I had to pull it down to one really so, sort of central idea, it's more about, uh, well, maybe two things. One is that, you know, I believe that Bitcoin works because of this underlying fundamental principle, because I do believe that there is a, a universal energy that connects all things and creates all things. I believe this to be true. And so, it would then follow logically that Bitcoin also would have emerged from this universal force. And uh, it makes sense to me in studying the Tao that we would at some point create or have been, been gifted a technology to allow us to interact in a way that is in alignment with this stream, with the energy that I was talking about earlier. And so th this problem of money is it's bigger than the fact that money doesn't really work properly. Like the, the problem of money creates all these other problems. It, it makes it puts us all in, in sort of a, a fend for yourself. Uh, you know, it's every person for themselves in the, in the broken money world where no one can really effectively store their value and time into the distant future. Every person has to continuously do what's best for themselves to look out for their own future and if you, you know, 
zoom out to a macro level that just makes it incredibly difficult for people to exist harmoniously with each other and go out and or arrange themselves in a civilization that is really civilized. And uh, so, so that's sort of the first idea. And the, the second part, I think, is trying to imagine what, what could then happen if you were able to replace all of those problems that result from bad money with a, with a good money, a fair money, a just money. And then what would that do to the world? What would happen as a result of everyone re, uh, reimagining their own way of being a person if they didn't have this problem of money? And I, I think it's much, much bigger than people simply being able to, you know, save money effectively or ch change their spending habits. To me, Bitcoin is a um, it's an agreement on a way of making sense of the world in a way that makes sense. And so if you have made sense of one thing in the world rationally, it's it's like once you do something once, then it becomes easier to do it a second time, a third time, a third time and so on. And so it if you start thinking about things in a, in a rational way, if you start having an expectation of rules that make sense and, and then everyone together is all looking at the same problem and saying, well, like we have this thing over here that we have money and, and that with money now, the rules of money make sense. And then we have this thing over here and this thing has no rules or the rules that we have. Well, these rules don't make any sense. So we got to, we need to get, get rid of those or fix those. So I think that Bitcoin can become a paradigm for us to think at a species level uh, about a system where the expectation of everyone is that rules we should have should make sense. They should be transparent. They should be something that we all agree on. So if we were to, if we were to start doing that with everything, that's when the world could look really different because I also think the reverse is true today where you have a society where nothing makes sense. So there's no expectation for things to make sense. Then of course the output is going to be like a senseless world. Like, you know, we have, we have no way to audit, you know, political decisions or money decisions. So people don't even care. They don't even try, you know, like they just go about their business. And, uh, you know, this is that idea of saying earlier about how everyone is really just forced to show up into the world and do the best they can and, and take care of themselves. And it's really like, you know, this is a journey of, of survival. Whereas uh, if all of a sudden, you know, people were to start thinking about a, a baseline expectation of, re, of rationality, like th then I think that what comes after that, when a critical threshold or number of people feel this way, what you're going to have is like a, a renaissance. It's going to be the, 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 uh, the, the spark for a golden age of reason a new uh, era of civilization where we we just have started thinking about things in a completely different way and this is this is very true of of different sort of ages of enlightenment if you think about the history of Europe where something happened a technology or an innovation or an an event and it caused people to start thinking about things in a totally different way and this is what i really think is going on with bitcoin right now and this is what I think is what, what we're watching unfold. And it's it's an idea that's diffusing. Bitcoin is an ex incredibly viral idea. Once people really get it, most people who really understand it start to get really obsessed about it. And they change the way they live and they start writing books, whatever, they sort of podcast, doing all this different stuff, right? And that process can keep unfolding until until everybody understands the idea. And maybe then at that point, we won't be doing Bitcoin podcasts anymore. We'll just be doing podcasts about civilization and how cool things have become because everyone now has changed and reframed their way of thinking about how they imagine reality. I, I very much hope that, that that's good, the, the case, and uh, I see it when when you look with when you talk with Bitcoiners and we talk a lot of Bitcoiners, they have this Bitcoin moment. Almost all of them. There, there are some that have already opened their eyes to central banks uh, uh, and to printing money to the to the world and, and other things that are, are going wrong maybe with the world. Um, but most of them got their eyes open with Bitcoin and then they questioned other things as you, as you described, they're like, oh, they, they, and I, I talked, uh, I think a few podcasts ago with, with someone uh, who said, um, why uh, people are, who are into, non-mainstream things 
uh, like in, into non-mainstream religion, non-mainstream whatever, uh, usually a little bit more open to, to the idea of Bitcoin because they already accept before that there is something that the mainstream doesn't accept. And they, mm -hmm. they believe to, uh, that to be true. And when you look in the mainstream and when you look into uh, normal land, just go out on the streets, on a busy street, ask like 10 people their opinion on bit Bitcoin. And you know, you get a sense for like what, what's the mainstream uh, opinion on, on, on Bitcoin right now. Uh, but when you go to, to someone who said like, oh, this and this and that, they have, they are open to the idea that something is, cannot be, something is different than uh, the mainstream believes it. They, they are at least open to the idea. They still don't get it all because then we would be f f more far ahead in the adoption. But at least it could be, uh, they are more open to that. And I think this is also a reason why we have so many people uh, from those uh, um, religions, from those uh, non-mainstream things into into Bitcoin. Uh, and this is a really cool thing. Did, did in your life... Uh, Bitcoin open some 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 eyes, or was it? Uh, or were you already primed for for Bitcoin? Yeah, I uh, it definitely did. You know, I and I think like not not everybody is really interested in becoming an expert in central banking and currency debasement and all of these things. And uh, you know, I I kind of happen to be so I when I started studying uh, when I started studying Bitcoin, it, it made sense for me fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, and just as a side point about the book, like part of the reason why I think these more tangential subjects around Bitcoin are, are interesting for the, for the community is because there are a lot of people who might be becoming Bitcoin curious right now who don't necessarily want to read the more like hardcore academic books, or they're not as interested in the technical aspects of why it works. And I also just think it's very true that, Bitcoin, Bitcoin to me, you, maybe not everybody needs to know all that stuff. And some people just want to know more about why it works. And there, there are these like fundamental underlying principles, the energetics of, of, of why something is possible. And this is partly why I think, you know, the religious aspect can, can come into it and, and, um, and offer maybe new people a doorway into making sense of the ideas or a, a comfortable uh, entrance into maybe then studying some of the more hardcore stuff. Uh, for me, yeah, I, I have spent most of my career in uh, traditional financial services doing different, uh, yeah, m mostly lots of work with pension plans. And uh, so I started studying Bitcoin in 2020 and uh, it had to do with, um, I'm in Canada. And uh, when, when, the, when lockdowns happened in the spring of 2020, the Canadian government just started printing a crazy amount of money, paying people to close their businesses, paying their employees to stay home, paying their rent for them. And, and I just really didn't understand, you know, it, it, that was really my light bulb moment. I, I realized that like, you know, I, it felt like something was wrong for a while, but I never really had enough time to uh, sit down and really pay attention to it. I wasn't really looking even to study Bitcoin. I was just trying to understand what the effect of all the money printing might be on the bond market because of uh, the pensions that I was working with uh, my customers. And uh, I read a Bitcoin book by accident. My, my first Bitcoin book was The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. And that one really um, shocked me and completely changed my, my thoughts about everything. I ended up reading every, you know, uh, over the course of 2020, I sort of read every single Bitcoin book I could find. And, uh, you know, it, it's like, you remember those uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, it was a really popular art piece to have like this pattern and you would have to unfocus your eyes. And if you could blur your eyes and then focus them again, you would see like a three dimensional pattern come out of it. And once, once you saw it, it was like impossible to not see it, but it could be really difficult for some people to get to the point where they could see it first. And that, that was totally what happened to me. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're that person that like, uncontrollably talking to everybody about Bitcoin and uh, not everybody's there, right? Like, cause to your point, I, I, it's such a funny thing how the average person on the street, and this still happens to me all the time. I was on a, I was on a flight uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, somebody, it had come up and, and the, and this person just really thought that Bitcoin was like a, 
you know, it's like a, a very niche and, uh, you know, kind of out there thing that, oh, I didn't even realize Bitcoin was still still existed. Like it's not not in my, you know, field of vision at all. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing to watch this uh, idea germinate in the human consciousness. Yeah, and I think this those four year cycles are also really interesting because most people get to know about Bitcoin when it gets to this crazy high or when it crashes down again. Uh, and the time, to, uh, time is usually all four years uh, as, as it was the, the last few decades, uh, the last few decades plus five years. Um, and I think then the idea of Bitcoin comes up again and they're like, oh, it's, it's up. Uh, it's, uh, I was seeing it at 2000 now, it's at 20,000. Oh no, but it now it crashed down to 10,000. Oh, I'm right. So I don't, I don't deal with it anymore. Then like four years later, it's like, what it is it? 60,000. Oh, it's crashed down to 30,000. Okay. I will not deal with it again. But the third time or fourth time or fifth time when they see it rising again and they, they, they seeing it lowering again, at some point it will make click for them. And they're like, this, this thing seems to just not go away and just keeps on growing and just keeps on making uh, more waves of adoption. Like uh, all of a sudden we have companies, countries and everyone in, in there uh, and we're just at the start of it and there's an ETF. There's like, there's so many different things happening and I feel like um, we, we will probably hit a point in the next few months or maybe one, two years where Bitcoin has this high again. Uh, Maybe not. Maybe it comes later. Maybe it comes earlier. Who knows of the timing? But probably we'll have hit again this point where uh, the price rises, and then all of a sudden everybody's like, "What? This this all happened?" But we Bitcoin know like the price is just the the third consequence of that. Like first, a lot of things happened. A lot of things got built. A lot of education got done, uh, and then the price moves after that. Uh, when everything comes and 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 it kind of shows what 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 the Bit, uh, Bitcoin community has been been doing for for the last four years, and it's it's interesting how uh, at least for now I think now it's really a calm time. Um, yeah, it's it's it's, it's a it's a cool concept. Um, but one of the uh, yeah a note here. Yeah, no, I. Uh... <laughs> I think everybody has like two or three touch points with Bitcoin before they actually start to take it seriously. And for a lot of people, I've met so many people where 2020 was the time that really woke them up. You know, and partly I think it was because the world really slowed down. And for the first time, there was enough time to stop what you were doing and pay attention and maybe start watching some videos on YouTube or, or whatever it was. Like I was... Um, I, I first remember Bitcoin in 2013. That was my first touch point. The coffee shop uh, in the, the main floor of the building I was living in at that time, right next to it was a, a coin store, like a coin and stamp store that sold Bitcoin. And I remember uh, having a coffee there like every day and looking at this Bitcoin sign in the window and just thinking like, who would be stupid enough to, you know, put some of their money in this Bitcoin thing? And uh, yeah, so this is... Uh, you know, we, we all sort of get the price we deserve. I, I, uh, I completely believe that not in it, not in a, not in a, you know, this person is better than you idea, but in just in the way of like, you, you get book Bitcoin when you are ready to pay serious attention and dig into the idea enough to understand that it is serious and has intellectual merit. And you have to push through all of the noise and natural reasons why people might want to discard it and move on or just it has to do with time i think it's it's when you are willing to commit to enough time to properly consider the possibility that bitcoin is serious if you are listening to this podcast you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of robin or how can i improve my bitcoin setup and there's two things you have to buy bitcoin from the right source and you have to store bitcoin the right way let's focus on the first thing how to buy bitcoin it's simple have a bitcoin only exchange don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that be on a bitcoin only exchange i use 21 bitcoin 21 bitcoin is for me the best partner for that and now where do you store bitcoin bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet so 
that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. And it's it's funny how we form an opinion on something. And I did this did exactly the same thing as you did. And I think almost everybody does it. We form an opinion before we even really know about it. Like mm -hmm. we hear, we read some story, we, we read some headlines somewhere, uh, wherever we, we got it. And then uh, we see it and we make an opinion or we got asked and make an opinion. And I'm really trying really hard and it's extremely difficult to not form opinions on everything because I know little to nothing of most of the topics in the world. And I'm this weird friend that says when he's asked like, oh, what do you think of that? And I'm like, sorry, I have, I have no clue about that. I have no opinion on that. It's just in, it is a topic that just does not interest me uh, right now. You can tell me more about it, but I have, I have, I have not uh, a good input to give and certainly no final opinion on, on anything, especially now with elections and, and everybody uh, wants to talk politics uh, now uh, more and more. So it's, it's like, for me, it's uh, a good step to just sometimes not make an opinion and if it interests you, then deeply research and then make an opinion out of that. Mm. But it's a it's a hard thing to do. I feel like the the human brain always wants to uh, pr prove that it's uh, a, a, it's a, a great great thing. <laughs> so so this is a great example, I think, of how Bitcoin is the foundation for this golden age of reason. Is like this is a, a perfect single person example of one person uh, learning seeing at one time this expectation of rules or something that makes sense or, or understanding that I didn't understand something before and now I do. And now that I have done that, I realize that when I do it with other things, I'm doing the thing that made me not understand Bitcoin in the first place. So it's like, it's a paradigm for you to now start thinking about everything in a new way. And it's like, this is something that changes people from the inside out. It changes everything about how you approach you know, problem solving, interacting with other people, all of these fundamental principles. And what's so cool about Bitcoin is because the rules don't change uh, and it's externally auditable, everybody has the same opportunity to sort of synchronize themselves to this system. So it's, it's, a, it's a gift that everyone can receive. It's just a matter of, um, you know, time and people having the, uh, the uh, willingness to uh, ponder it. How, how will this look like? Uh, I think it's an almost impossible uh, answer answering this, this question, but how, how will uh, a world be different when we all of a sudden are all on this, this Bitcoin standard? We all went through some sort of this humbling experience of this uh, uh, experience that, oh, we, we were not right at that time and now... We, we have to adopt Bitcoin at a later time because I also saw Bitcoin uh, almost four years earlier and formed an opinion and I had three years long that opinion that Bitcoin is a scam mm -hmm. till I had one weekend where I actually researched it and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> I was wrong for three <laughs> years, uh, which is a humbling experience. Uh, but but how does the world look like on, on, a, on a Bitcoin standard and, and on, on this golden age what you're talking about? You know, I think that it will look so first, I think what, what's really one of the most interesting things about Bitcoin is that even the people who understand it the best or have been thinking about it the longest are still having new ideas about it all the time. So it's not like you get Bitcoin and then you're done. Like if you think about people like Jeff Booth, who are on all the podcasts all the time, he's still having new new realizations and new aha moments 
like he's still on his own journey. So it's, it, there's not an end point. It's a, it's a transformation and that I think we, we don't even really know where it's going. So, um, so that's one really interesting aspect of wondering about what it looks like when uh, a sufficient number of society has experienced this transformation. And some people are even further along than they are now. Uh, but I think the, the answer to that is it will be as different as, you know, how things are now from, you know, 300 years ago, 800 years ago, 1000 years ago, where it's hard to even imagine how people were living at that time. People will look back at what we're doing exactly right now and think, I can't believe they used to do that. I can't believe they used to let somebody be in charge of making the money and then they would just make it worthless and there was no control mechanism and nobody had an expectation that the money would be something that retained its value into the future. That's insane. You know, and like all of the things that resulted from that, like as if people will look back and think like, why would every country want to manage their own money? And like, why would countries want to trade each other's meaningless paper with each other? Like it's just, it's just a technology from a, from a dated era of, of uh, human civilization. You know, this is something that was an, an innovation, you know, 100 years ago, with the creation of central banks, we needed a way to move money very quickly around the world. So gold transformed into this paper representation of gold, so that it would enable a, a new era of, of uh, international trade. And that that made sense. But technology has changed a lot over the last 100 years, right? And uh, what I think is just what needs to catch up now to the reality of technology today is human consciousness. Like we're just, we now need to catch up with the way we think about things to, in a way that matches the reality of what is possible with technology. And that's getting harder and harder because the pace of technological advancement is seemingly advancing at a rate that's like, it's, it's difficult to keep track of how fast things are moving. So I think it's like, you know, <clears throat> at a, at a species level, it's almost like waking up out of a dream. And when you've been sleeping and you're, you're sort of like deep in a slumber, it's not obvious, uh, you know, maybe that you're even asleep. And then you, you, you know, the process of waking up and then you, when you, when you're awake now, it's, it's almost becomes then difficult to remember the dream. And, uh, it, it, these things happen at a, at a different uh, time scale. If you're instead of thinking about one person, if you're thinking about all of humanity, so instead of like you know a matter of minutes, then this could be like decades. But I think that's what's going on right now is that we have been uh, thinking about things one way, and we're at the end of that time. And now what we're we're slowly waking up out of this deep slumber, and what will come on the other side of this is people just fundamentally thinking about because it's more than money, right? It's property. If you start thinking that people will entirely imagine property differently, then then they're going to start imagining, you know, their their goals differently. Like you, you know, there's going to be no point to try and own four houses so that you can have three of them be Airbnbs in the in that Bitcoin future. So it's just going to fundamentally change the way we think about our motivations for doing things and for collecting things, having things. Um, it, it's like, it's a new language for exchanging things with each other. And um, yeah. And so I, I think it's going to completely, it, it's unavoidable. That it will totally change human civilization. Could it lead to an abundant future where because of a sound money standard and productivity ever increasing with robotics, AI and, and whatnot, what um, and all those things coming into one place uh, that maybe everything that we have to do to survive is kind of cared for like we have all the systems and the processes and infrastructure in place where the humankind uh, can really focus on the next things like i don't know space exploration or some art things or they can they can basically do what what they uh, tend to really love and really like and really want to explore and not to like uh, have this are we I feel like most of society now has to like really struggle, like keep up with the bills, keep up with the things 
uh, and and only a small percentage of humanity can actually uh, enjoy the fruits of life and and really like uh, enjoy reading a book uh, on a day, just like diving deep into topics. But if we come to this world where everything is getting cheaper and cheaper because we get better and better in producing it, and we have this abundant future uh, with with the golden age, what you described, could we come to like a point where we we as humankind have kind of figured everything out and, and uh, we, we live in this uh, dream world, which, uh, which I don't even want to dream of. <laughs> Utopia. Yeah. Um, you know, so y you live in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And the, the reason, uh, you know, I think that we, this is, this is such a great example of us, how we will look back at the time we're living in now and just think of it as, as being very, as a very dark time, because architecture is, is one of the best examples of the, you know, the, the world that we create for ourselves is a reflection of how we are imagining and thinking about that world. And the stuff that we were building hundreds of years ago in cities like Vienna are these timeless uh, works of art that are really, you know, when you when you see sort of the the um, the uh, uh, the gardens and the the classical palaces in Vienna, what you are felt with is this feeling of uh, uh, the expansion of your imagination. You know, this is our architecture that is designed to uplift and inspire, and people would never be able to build buildings like that today. Not because maybe we don't have the technology, but because it, in a fiat world, it, we have to build things to make money. And there's no way that you could make money building a building that took 30 years to build and uh, was designed to last forever. Like we have to build things so that they break and then we get to build them again and make money again by replacing them with something new. And uh, and so this has created over over a longer period of time, decades it's kind of like degradation of culture. What we're doing is building an environment for ourselves that is disposable. We live in this fast food world that lacks sort of imagination and inspiration. And this is why when you go to a city like Vienna, what you see are these, you know, the incredible works of art next to these like soulless glass buildings that have, you know, in a thousand years, if, if, if like if civilization ended tomorrow, and aliens arrived in a thousand years, the glass buildings would be gone. Uh, and the, and those, uh, you know, 18th century, 17th century buildings would probably still be there. And they would probably look just about exactly the same because they were designed to last. And so even that concept, I think, is when we're building the buildings like we're building today and living in them, it's we understand on some level, like we're taking in all this information all the time. And so what we, we very much now are all products of this fiat society that, it, that is pervasive through all elements of how we interact with each other. And, and one of the best ways we can see this is by actually just stopping and looking at the world that we're building for ourselves that we have to as a result of this. And I, so I think that's going to change like architecture. I think we're going to stop building these temporary structures that these like devoid of imagination and we, we're just going to expand and start thinking about possibilities in, in new ways because we would be able to build incredible things if it wasn't about if, if it wasn't based on fiat profit uh, i love that uh, that that view and i think uh, and and yeah vienna is an, an amazing example i'm i'm not that far away i can I, I walk there. Uh, I mean, I'm still like uh, now. I'm the fourth day in Vienna, so I'm I'm not a Vienna expert <laughs> now. But uh, I uh, have like I don't know twenty minutes to walk to the Schönbrunn uh, Palace, uh, which is an amazing big palace, really beautiful, a really big space, uh, and and you can just go there and, and enjoy the the view and enjoy the the architecture. Uh, even there are like concerts, free concerts where, where people can go there and there's like uh, old classical move, uh, old classical, uh, uh, music uh, playing. So it's a, it's a wonderful 
experience and it's kind of like the window in this 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 time where in this golden age uh, that uh, that we we could imagine uh, and it's uh, I, I love it a lot and uh, one thing uh, from the book that i still wanted to touch on is uh, the subtitle uh, and the subtitle mm. is towards a cosmology of energy money what what is energy money for you Uh, thank you for asking that question. I thought I'll very carefully about the subtitle of the book because, um, and I, and I sort of chose every, every word carefully. And so firstly, maybe cosmology is a money that has, is a, is a, excuse me, is a word that has to do with understanding something's place in the universe. And, uh, so, so I think that it relates first to this idea of, the bigger concept of what is what does energy money mean for us uh you know how does it help us how does it change our understanding of the universe of existence and uh energy money you know to me i, I think about bitcoin this is how i imagine bitcoin is bitcoin is a is a monetary system where the underlying commodity or the thing that produces or guarantees the value, uh, uh, the commodity in Bitcoin is energy. And so it, it's a system where energy goes in and then the output or the product is money, is, this, is, is Bitcoin. And uh, it's a system that enables us to transform energy into money. And what we do with our own body is we transform energy into money You know, we, we turn our, our time and our physical effort into a product or a service. And that thing is transformed into energy. Sorry, is it transformed into money? And so money should have a relationship to energy. It, it makes sense that money should have a, have a be tied to reality through the consumption of energy. And Bitcoin is energy money because it also consumes energy in its production. And so it has an intrinsic connection to energy. And this Taoist principle is that everything is connected by energy. So it makes sense that the one uniting factor to connect all of humanity would be also a money that is also connected to energy. So I think that uh, there is a really interesting uh, sort of philosophical uh, comparison to be made when we are exchanging money we are actually exchanging energy. If I had to work to earn money and I'm going to give you that money to, uh, in exchange for something that you are, have used your energy to create that, that is an exchange of energy. We're just using something in between to measure how much of my energy I'm trading for how much of your energy. And so there's sort of that aspect of it that is, you know, so very philosophical or metaphysical, And then on the other side, it is very literal. We know exactly how much energy is consumed in mining a block. It's measurable. And Bitcoin allows us to start thinking about energy sort of at a planetary level. We have now with Bitcoin a way to turn energy that would otherwise be useless because it is, you know, in some remote hydro, uh, you know, a Bitcoin mine uh, being powered by a, a remote river in somewhere in Africa. Well, the, now somebody there can turn that into electricity, turn it into money, send that money elsewhere, you know, so they can capture that energy. And, it, and it's a way for us to think about all of the energy that is available to us on earth and un, unite it in a, in, a, in a single system of measuring and appropriately valuing and connecting everything. So all of a sudden energy that is in Africa can be sent to Russia in, in the form of money, uh, in the same way it it's connecting everything. Uh, so, so that's sort of the idea. Bitcoin is an energy money system that has the ability to, to connect everything. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's the next step to climb up the ladder. I forgot how this model works, uh, how this model is named, but we are coming to a type one civilization and then maybe expanding, mm -hmm. uh, the above. Scale. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The Kardashev scale. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's fascinating to think of, of that. It's kind of like a, a measuring tool also for time. Uh, and when you adopt the Bitcoin standard, for me, at least I value my time and my, uh, energy and, and my, where I spend money completely different because w whenever you spend 
uh, money, you have to now think of like, oh, would I buy this also if it would be 2x like the price? Because mm -hmm. Bitcoin can go up really quickly uh, um, and in, in price or the price measured in Bitcoin could fall really quickly in the, the next few uh, weeks uh, when we look at that item. Um, so whenever I spend money, whenever I spend time with someone, uh, I'm, I'm way more careful of, of why I do that and, and, and try to get like, what do I really want and what do I really uh, like? And and that's that's distinguishes, uh, I think, the, this, this feared mindset from a, a Bitcoin mindset where we value our resources a lot and not just throw all the resources out there and hope that something sticks. We really try, like we, we try to get something right. Yeah. And I, and I think it's because when you're using Bitcoin, you're now using a system that has the ability to store your energy and your time. So like I was saying about for you to earn money, you know, it's some combination of your time and energy. Those two things are the input and then the output is money. And in the fiat money system, um, you know, both of those things are diminished or devalued as the value of the money erodes. So you have no ability in the fiat money system to store your energy or your time. And so there's no value on time. There is no way to va properly value your time. So it's almost better to think about, to not think about it. And this is why people, I think, you know, use even these expressions like time flies or you know, blowing their money. It's like when you think about why would anybody blowing your money is like the idea of like scattering the dust out of the palm of your hand. You're like, whew, right. And uh, if something was really valuable, why would you waste it? Why would you, why would you waste your money if it was truly a representation of time, which is actually the most valuable thing anyone has. The one thing that we have that is absolutely all finite for each of us is time. And so what the fiat money system does is it actually compresses the value of your time and there's no limit to how far it can compress that value as it it cuz it can continue to lose diminish that value infinitely and when it's doing that it is diminishing the value of the time that you spent to earn that money so you have no way to store your time you have no way to appropriately um preserve it and and so I think that's a very painful thought. That's a very, that's a very sad place to be. And so uh, this is also why I think Bitcoiners can become very optimistic and why they change their, their preference for how they spend their time is because when you adopt a Bitcoin way of thinking, now all of a sudden your time is actually appreciating. You're almost gaining time because you have a feeling that into the distant future, you have the ability to store that energy and time effectively. So it's not flying. It's not going, you know, it's not like floating out of the palm of your hand. It's stored. It, it's immortal. You know, the Bitcoin is a system that allows you to preserve that energy. And uh, so then it, it removes the threat of having someone steal your time from you, which I think is sort of the fundamental way that it enables people, if I'm not worried about my time being stolen, then I don't need to steal yours. You know, it's like, I'm, I, I can, I can go out and we can have an interaction with each other. And both of us have this sort of sense of security. It's, it's a completely new way for us to think about interacting with each other like that. I think this is, this is also one of the core ideas about Taoism and Bitcoin together is that Taoism is very much a personal journey. It's an internal thing that happens. And then as a result of having this internal reflection, a transformation of your way of thinking about interacting with this force, it then changes the way you would interact with other people who are having a similar experience. And then as many people have this changed experience, that creates a society. And this is exactly the same thing that's happening with Bitcoin, is people are experiencing an awakening. They're experiencing a new way of thinking about things. And as a result of those thoughts, they're going out and they're connecting with other people that are having similar ideas. This is how we're on this podcast right now. And this is the early stages of this golden age of reason. It's just very early. But imagine as that number is like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, we're, we're watching this process unfold right now. And I think that uh, that, so that hinges on this virality, the unstoppable nature of 
the human mind's capacity to be awakened. I think we, we can all have this experience and uh, it, it will happen with enough time. It's uh, it's fascinating to talk with you. You're clearly a deep thinker. It's just like I have so many uh, topics already written down, and then for, was like we we should also get in your Bitcoin for Financial Advisors book and and what you're doing at Block Reward, and, and you're also hosting a podcast. Uh, but we are already at, at the one hour mark, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, we we probably like just make a second round at, at half a year and or a year and and take uh, take other topics on there. Uh, so thank you for for that already um but before we come to our end routine and before we end the, the podcast uh um, i always ask one question to bitcoiners what are you currently passionate about deeply learning besides of bitcoin like what are you really passionate about uh, besides the whole bitcoin conversation oh uh interesting question um I would say I have uh, over since finishing the book, I have resumed uh, my studying Mandarin because I have an ambition to uh, be able to converse some of these ideas uh, with with Bitcoiners in China. And I'm, I'm very curious to know what the Bitcoin conversation in China is like. Uh, and I and I hope to translate the book to Mandarin and uh so I, so I, it's a study that I have been, uh, uh, coming and going on for, for sort of 20 years. And, um, you know, you get, you get busy with life and I, and I live somewhere in Canada, there's not much opportunity to, uh, to use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but, uh, that's, that's what I'm working on right now. Amazing. How others, um, do you already have any insights in how, uh, Chinese people, I mean, we know how the Chinese government <laughs> look at, look at, at Bitcoin. Yeah. My, my understanding is that it's very popular. You know, I think that one of the, if, for people who have spent time in China, you understand that, um, what is reported on the outside for outsiders versus the reality of what it's like there is always very different. And, Even things like, um, you know, I think generally the perception in the West is that people there are much less free. And I had a very different experience during my, my time in China. I think the average person in China is maybe actually more free than people are in the West today. It, because there are so many people in China, it's very difficult to uh, enforce a lot of the, the, the smaller rules that in Europe or in North America, you know, we, we've, we've kind of gradually become, uh, very almost over governed, uh, you know, and this is something that has been a, a growing problem. I think, I think in the West and as, as technology has enabled, you know, sort of greater surveillance by governments, uh, and they, they have all these things in China too, but it's just a totally different dynamic. So I think that, uh, they are very free people in, in their own way. Personal liberties are are a sort of a, a core a core a core part of Chinese culture as well. So I I think that uh, from what I can tell, Bitcoin is alive and thriving. Uh, it's just not as uh, not as open, or it's not maybe what is being presented on the international media. It's interesting uh, because you're the second guest that actually says uh, that the Chinese people are way more free uh, than. Then, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and the U.S., uh, I think Michelle weekly made this example of when she traveled around the world and she was in a lot of different countries, also in China, also in Dubai and also other countries in Europe. Uh, and when she then came back to the United States and she tried to speak with like, Uh, friends and families about topics, uh, and there was like topics of politics. There was this topic of other uh, other things, uh, and they were like, "Oh, you cannot talk about that." And it's like uh, it's a different form of of uh, censorship uh, going on in different parts of the world. But it's very interesting how how this the, the the dynamics of the different countries and the dynamics of freedom of speech and freedom in general. Uh, is, is going. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied actually with the freedom you have in Austria. I'm not satisfied with the tax rates. I'm not satisfied with the bureaucracy, but with the freedom in general, I'm, I'm quite satisfied. Uh, even though there's a lot of uh, weird things coming from the European Union, uh, but it's nothing that really bothers me at this point. 
there are some proposals that could bother me a lot, but uh, that, that's future. Let's see. Let's see how it all uh, shapes out. Uh, perfect. Then, yeah, you have a note. Yeah, just maybe on that. You know, I I think it's they're all just really relative things, and uh, so they could be small things. They're things that are so small we don't even think about them. Like in Canada, you need to get a permission. Uh, you need to get a permit from your local government to change a toilet in your house. You know, the so it's like, you know, we, we just uh, there's there's some things have just maybe changed. Like you, then you go to a country like Nicaragua. And like, you don't need permission to do anything. You buy a piece of land and you just start building on it. And like, so there's a broad spectrum of, of what we're allowed to do and what we think of as being like, you know, uh, control. It's, it's a fascinating time to be alive. What, what is uh, freedom for you? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. You know, I, I would have answered it one way, I think, uh, until like maybe four years ago. And, and now, now it's very different. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it, I would have always just thought about it as having the ability to sort of move freely and, um, and feel that the government is, um, working on your behalf to organize people in a way that is safe and fair for everyone. And, and that's kind of what I, what I think it should be. I think that, um, Freedom is really, you know, having the ability to, to pursue the the life that you want, as long as that's not doing anything that's really hurting anyone else. And uh, yeah, that, that's probably what I would say. Uh, free, freedom uh, goes as far as the freedom from someone else starts. So uh, that's yeah. uh, it's a line that I, I really liked and, and that I heard a lot. Um, perfect. And let's get to the end routine uh, of our podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. So it, it's always like a little bit of a different a question. It's also a little bit uh, not uh, tailored to the guest, which I really like. And your question is, what would you say to your younger self when you were like 15 years old or 16 years old, which is not about Bitcoin? Holy, what would I say to my younger self? You know, I, I, pro I probably would say uh, start learning languages. I, I grew up in a in a part of Canada that is very English speaking, English speaking only. And uh, when I was in my teenage years, it wasn't very obvious for me that I would want maybe in the future to have the opportunity to communicate with people in other languages. And it's something that has been uh, uh, it's, you know, the older you get, I think for most people, the more difficult it is to to learn languages and people like probably yourself who you're very fortunate when you grow up in, in areas where I've, I've met people from central Europe and they know like six, eight languages just because that that's just a very normal thing. And uh, I've always been envious of, of, of those, of, of that opportunity. So studying languages would be, uh, I, cause I also think that, um, you know, learning how to think about how to express ideas in a, in a, in a different language changes your ability to, think about expression it makes you more of a uh a, you know really expands your mind so uh so that would be uh that would be my answer yeah unfortunately i don't speak six eight languages but <laughs> i would love to <laughs> i only speak uh english and german i have some roots uh, also in france so uh, there was this time where I tried to learn uh, uh the french language uh but i'm 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 like only German and English I really know. Like German is my native language. Uh, English, I kind of force myself to really learn good so I can speak on the podcast. I also have an Indian uh, girlfriend. Uh, she is teaching me a little bit Hindi, uh, the, the the language of of, uh, of India. But uh, it's it's language. I'm I'm really not good in languages, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, that's just a side note. Uh, usually in, in in the middle of Europe, people actually it's not rare that people speak like uh, one, two, three additional languages to their mother language. Uh, and they're also like those, Austria has a, a little bit of a different way of saying something than Germans, than there are Swiss, where they are like a different kind of German also. Uh, then there's like Czech and Slovakia, where they, they can understand, understand each other, but it's a different language. So there are a lot of, 
interesting uh, patterns uh, and and things uh, about language in in, in middle of Europe. Uh, and mm -hmm. we are definitely I don't know if you're more inclined to 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 learn about languages, but we're definitely inclined to learn about languages. And this is probably a little bit different in America and English speaking areas where they just don't really have the need to speak other languages because wherever they go, they can speak English and almost everybody understands them to a certain degree. Uh, and this is uh, something, uh, yeah, a, a big difference, but yeah. Um, and, yeah. and English, English speaking people have this really weird and kind of unfortunate expectation that other people will like to speak English. Right? It's like, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's probably coming from when, when so many people speak English and most understand you, you kind of expect it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and there's this nice chart I have now in my mind where, um, when you, when you are as an English speaker, you're coming to, to Europe and you try to speak that, uh, uh, um, the native language. And there's like this, the German way is like, Oh, oh no, no, I can also speak English. It's okay. You don't have to try. Mm. <laughs> and there's these different reactions in the different part of the world. I, I, I love that charge a lot. Um, perfect. And yeah, thank you for, for being on uh, Scott, uh, before I let you go, uh, where can people find you when they read your book or they want to read your book and they have questions about it? Where can they reach out to you and ask you questions? Uh, yeah, for sure. It's the, the easiest place to find me is on Twitter. I'm on, I'm on Twitter probably more than I should be. And, uh, my, ha my handle is lantern Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I will, I will drop it in the, in the description, uh, as always, like, uh, as always, uh, the, in, in the des, in the description uh, of every guest, there's always the the link uh, of how to contact them, and it's ninety seven percent of the time uh, in a Twitter link, <laughs> but, uh, and then you can find him and, and reach out to him. Uh, thank you, Scott, for being on, and for everyone listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye. Thanks so much for having me on.